Hey guys, welcome back to Pop Map Chem. In this video, we're going to be carrying on with Unit 313, the HL material, and looking at transition metal complexes in a bit more detail and a theory that helps us understand them, namely crystal field theory. So we're going to look at magnetism and then we're going to explain some intricacies of the orbitals in these complexes. But first, have a go at drawing this copper complex to review what we covered in the last video. Pause and have a go. So in this complex, we can see that copper ion in the center is going to have a two plus charge because water has no charge ligand. So we draw a copper in the center and we can see there's six water molecules. So we're going to have an octahedral complex. Now remember when we're drawing our structure to draw our arrows indicating that all of these will be dative covalent bonds and then we will have our six pairs of electrons that will be being donated by one of the lone pairs on each of the water molecules. Then we put our square brackets around and write the overall charge of the ion. So before we take another look at the complexes, I wanted to cover magnetism. So there are actually three types of magnetism and these go beyond just the types you may be familiar with. First, we have diamagnetic. So this is something that has no unpaired electrons. It is very weak magnetic force and it repels a magnetic field. So this is where there are no unpaired electrons. Paramagnetism, on the other hand, is where we do have unpaired electrons. So this is a slightly stronger force than will be felt with the diamagnetic, and it is instead an attractive force. So the unpaired electrons are attracted to a magnetic field. Now, the types of magnets that you may know about or see in your daily life are what we called ferromagnets. These are your old school magnets. And this is caused actually by paramagnetic nuclei that kind of align and organize themselves over long range distances so that the individual tiny effects of the attraction of the paramagnet is amplified if we like. These are called domains. So if we imagine we had a bar magnet, each domain would have all of its unpaired electrons line up in the same direction. This gives the property of the long range magnetism that we're used to in our daily experience, but only nickel, cobalt and iron actually exhibit this type of magnetism. To be able to tell if we have a diamagnetic or paramagnetic, we use a thing called a Goy balance, where an electromagnet is applied to a sample. If the sample is red here and the blue is the electromagnet, if the sample is repelled out of the field, then you have a diamagnetic compound. And if it is pulled in, it is paramagnetic. Don't need to know about this balance in IB, but there is a way for us to determine if we have diamagnetic or paramagnetic compounds in the absence of the obvious long range properties that ferromagnets have. But you don't need a balance. All you need to do is identify if there's any unpaired electrons. Let's try a couple of questions on that. Trying it first with this valence d orbitals. Would you expect this valence d orbital to be dire or paramagnetic? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Here we can see we have four pairs of electrons, so four sets of paired electrons. However, one unpaired electron. So if we've got any unpaired electrons, this is going to be paramagnetic. So another set of valence D electrons. Would you expect this to be dire or paramagnetic? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Here we can see we only have one lone unpaired valence electron. So if we have an unpaired, it's going to be again paramagnetic. One last question on magnetism then, would we expect this valence d-orbital to be dire or paramagnetic? Pause the video to have a go. 
pop them up. So here we had a full D shell. So we had five pairs of electrons. If we have all paired valence electrons, it's going to be diamagnetic. Remember that we're never going to be able to tell just from the electron configuration if something is ferromagnetic. For that, we have to know if it is nickel, cobalt, or iron. Moving on to crystal field theory is really a theory that we use to help us explain how these d orbitals change. The way we just presented them in magnetism is that all of those orbitals would be of the same energy, and that's what we call degenerate d orbitals. However, what we actually find is that when they're in the presence of an electric field, the d orbitals split. And that split causes two of the d orbitals to become higher energy and three of the d orbitals to become lower energy. The reason for this is to do with the shapes of the d orbitals. The two splits are called the T2g, the three low energy, and the Eg, the high energy. If we look at the axes and where in our octahedral complexes we would expect the ligands to be attracted towards the central ion, which would be in these diagrams represented in the very center of the axis, we can see that they are approaching along the x, y, and z axes. So in the T2g orbitals, the ligands are attracted to the central ion and they can go in between all of the orbitals. They don't have to go through the electrons. However, when we look at the EG orbitals, their shape lies on the axis. So the ligands try to donate electrons through electron density. And as we know, like repels like. So because the ligands are attracted to the central ion through those, they are going to increase repulsion. And because they increase repulsion, that means that they are going to have a higher energy. Remember, at IB, you won't be asked to draw these orbitals. I'm merely illustrating why we get that energy separation between our T2G and our EG sets of orbitals. So this splitting has an associated energy that goes with it. We would have five degenerate d orbitals usually, and we end up with two high energy d orbitals and three low energy d orbitals. So there is an associated gap in energy between these two, between the T2g and the Eg orbitals. And that gap we could call delta E is called the crystal field splitting energy. This is applicable to all octahedral complexes. So everything's fine. However, this does have some implications for how we go about representing filling up these orbitals. If we have four electrons, for example, in the degenerate orbitals, this was no problem. We put one unpaired electron in each. However, now we have an option. We can either put the unpaired electron in our higher energy EG orbital or our lower energy T2G orbital. But how do we know which one? It may seem initially obvious because we have to consider the fact that now there is this delta E, this energy gap between the T2G and EG, so we would expect to fill the lower level orbitals first. However, we also have to consider the pairing energy of the electrons. Remember, to put two electrons in the same orbital, we have to overcome a certain level of electron repulsion, which requires energy. If you just think back to the trends we saw going across the periodic table in first ionization energy, there were some instances where we have to take this into consideration. If we call our pairing energy P, we now have two things to consider, both delta E, the difference between the energy levels, and P, the energy required to pair electrons in the same orbital. So considering pairing energy is likely to stay pretty similar, we need to consider what factors are going to affect the value of delta E. 
The first factor we're going to look at is the oxidation state or the charge of the central ion. And this makes sense. The larger the charge on the central ion, the more it's going to attract the lone pairs on the ligands towards itself. And that is going to increase the repulsion of the ligands that have to push through the d orbitals, those eg orbitals. So larger charge equals larger delta e. We also have the nature of the ligand, and luckily you don't have to remember these. They are given in the spectrochemical series that is in the data booklet, because some ligands are stronger field ligands. That means that they more actively push or are attracted towards the central ion. We call these strong field ligands. Strong field ligands are going to increase the value of delta E because they're going to increase the repulsion in those EG orbitals, further increasing the energy gap between the T2G low energy and the EG high energy orbitals. There are two other factors which we're not really going to look at in depth in IB, and that's firstly the geometry. For example, tetrahedral geometries their value of delta E is 4 over 9 times what it would be for the equivalent octahedral complex. And also ion identity. The delta E actually increases as you go down the transition metal group. But we're only going to look at number 1 and 2 in the IB in detail. So let's take a look at this spectrochemical series, which you'll find in table 15 of the data booklet, and the ligands in more detail. As we go from left to right, we increase how strong field the ligand is. So on the right side of the spectrochemical series, you have your strong field ligands. And on the left hand side, you have your weak field ligands. We'll differentiate those more precisely in a few moments. To summarize, weak field ligands have weak interactions with the central ion. And they're not and so therefore they don't split the d orbitals very much we have a small value of delta e because they're not pushing through those high energy eg orbitals over on the right where we have strong field ligands these have strong metal interactions and so force their way through those eg orbitals and create a large difference in energy between the low energy T2G orbitals and the high energy EG orbitals, creating a large value of delta E. However, the charge on the central atom plays an important role in what we consider strong and what we consider weak field. If we have a two plus charge ion in the center, then ligands that are to the right of and including CN minus are considered strong field ligands. So only these last two in that spectrochemical series underlying in green. If we increase the charge of the central ion, so let's say an M2 plus ion, then ligands to the right of and including water all become strong field ligands. So you're only going to be looking at M2 plus and 3 plus at IB, but you can see this would make sense because the increased charge in the center is going to pull those ligands and attract them more. The ones highlighted pink here would all be considered strong field ligand for a 3 plus ion. And these leave us with two different types of complexes. When we have weak field ligands, we get spin free complexes. And when we have strong field ligands, we get spin paired complexes and these names help us understand how the electrons are structured between the new split d orbitals so let's have a look at what that actually looks like if we take our orbitals now we're going to have two high energy orbitals and three low energy but on the left hand side i've got a low value of delta e the splitting energy is not very high which would indicate probably weak field ligands and on the right we have a large value of delta e indicating probably strong field ligands 
Let's take two example complexes then. We'll make them both iron 2 plus complexes with differing ligands. So we'll have FeH2O6, 2 plus, and we'll have FeCn6, 4 minus, because the charge on Cn is minus 1. So because H2O is a weak field ligand, it doesn't drive through the EG orbitals very effectively and doesn't separate the energy of the two sets of orbitals by very much. Whereas the cyanide ion is much more attracted to the central ion and drives through those EG orbitals, creating a large value of delta E. So how do we go about filling up the electrons respectively? Well, first of all, we need to know how many electrons we're dealing with. And we know with Fe2+, we've got 3d6. So we've got six electrons. So with our complex on the left, we enter our first three, and then we have a choice. Remember, we have to choose. Is the pairing energy going to be larger than delta E or smaller than delta E? Well, because delta E in this case is very small, it's likely pairing energy will be larger. So we start filling up the EG orbitals first and then back down to pair the last sixth electron. When we look at the complex on the right hand side, we see that delta E is much larger. And so in this case, delta E is going to be greater than the pairing energy. So in this case, the electrons will be preferentially paired in the lower energy T2G orbitals. This means on the left, we have a spin free because more electrons are free to move to the upper orbitals. And on the right, we have a spin paired because we preferentially pair the electrons. Time for some questions on these then. First question, what energy pairing or crystal field splitting energy must be larger for a spin free complex to form? Pause the video. Pop them up. So remember in a spin free complex, we're going to preferentially put unpaired electrons in the higher energy EG orbitals first, which means that the pairing energy must have been larger than delta E, which means it requires less energy to overcome delta E than it does pairing energy. Next question, if delta E is small, is a spin paired or a spin free complex more likely? Pause and have a go. pop them up. So just like in the last question, if delta E is smaller than P, then we're going to preferentially fill those high energy orbitals before we pair electrons in the lower energy orbitals. So a spin free complex is more likely. Last question is a little bit more involved. Is the cobalt complex here a spin free or a spin paired complex. Pause the video and take some time. Pop em up. We have to use all our knowledge of complex ions here. We can see that there's going to be an octahedral complex surrounded by six ammonia ligands. Now we know that ammonia has zero charge. So if ammonia has zero charge, then we're able to calculate the overall charge on the central cobalt ion as two plus. Now, when the ion charge is two plus, ammonia is considered a weak ligand. Now we know from weak ligands form small values of delta E as they don't separate the orbitals. And that means that delta E is likely smaller than the pairing energy. So we are likely to have spin free complexes because it requires less energy to put unpaired electrons in the slightly higher energy EG orbitals than to pair them in the lower energy T2G orbitals.
questions for you to do on both magnetism and crystal field theory. And in the next video, we'll be looking at how this phenomena produces colors in these compounds. Thanks again for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.